We are in July. How has 2016 been for you? How would you describe 2016 so far? So we are mid-year. Yes, mid-year. Mid-year, the, the first half, I believe, has been quite challenging. Um, for all of us in Ghana, uh, we were hoping by now we would be seeing the back of Doomsaw. Unfortunately, the problem keeps bouncing back. Um, and because of that, we see that uh, electricity supply for industry and for also domestic uses hasn't been quite stable, affecting uh, production, affecting employment, affecting cost of living, and life has been quite severe. And then, of course, the, the uh, unpredictable weather patterns because of climate change. So uh, it's been quite challenging the first half of the year. Okay. When, when people say that um, we are in this crisis, the energy crisis, because previous administrations or previous governments did not take bold decisions, how does that make you feel? Because you were there for eight years. I take that as just political talk. Eight years should be long enough for anybody with solutions to show. And the current regime has been in power eight years almost. So if we are not having the solutions, uh, we shouldn't accept uh, shifting of blame onto earlier regimes. Okay. Now, I mean, you, you're a statesman, and a lot of people admire you for the kind of service and dedication you're showing to this country after leaving office. How do you combine the hectic schedule of being a statesman and your commitments abroad? Because I want to believe that you get invited to international uh, events and summits. How do you combine it, life after presidency? Um, I presume I get the invitation to go abroad because of uh, the description you've given me, statesman. Mm. Uh, they say charity begins at home, and I must have served well in Ghana. And it's because of that that I get the invitations to go out. So I, I don't find the combination uh, exacting. You know, it, it comes naturally. Do you, do you miss being in office sometimes? Uh, no. I believe I left office feeling quite fulfilled. I had a very long period in public service. Mm. I started in my 20s <laughs> and ended exactly on my 70th birthday. And if I'm not satisfied with that, then nothing would satisfy me. So I, I think I'm all right. Okay. Mm. Now, I want, we'll come back to politics and then yourself later. I want us mm. to focus on Africa for a bit. Mm. There are many who say that Africa has been rising. There was a time when everyone thought that, yes, is the beacon of hope. Uh, things were changing in the right direction. But there are some who also still think that we are not getting the right leadership on the continent. Hence, the problems several countries on the continent continue to face. I believe leadership everywhere, and I'm speaking not only of Africa, but the whole world, leadership is the pivot around which everything else revolves. So wherever there's a, a failure or deficit of leadership, expect to have challenges or crises. And um, so uh, in this regard, Africa is no exception. But uh, the, around the world, generally, somehow the perception is that Africa, and in fact, a former prime minister of Britain said it, that Africa was the, like, the last frontier of human development. And so because of that, and especially into the modern times of globalization, where the world is moving, changing so fast, um, we are all concerned, especially stakeholders, that Africa should find uh, its rightful place in the movement of the world into globalization. Mm. And for Africa to find its place, proper place, befitting place, we should ha get the right leadership. Africa is a big continent of many countries, uh, over 50 countries. And uh, not all of us are of uniform background. Some perhaps are more developed than others. So if we want to sense some uniformity of the entire continent moving uh, in the right direction, then we would say perhaps we should have across the board a certain quality of leadership that is aware of the trends of the world, 
and also of the forces that are moving transformation of the world. So uh, it would lead uh, the countries of the continent uh, with vision and purpose. So the continent as a whole would sort of leapfrog mm. to, uh, into the right niche Okay. Uh, of, of the global okay. arrangement. When you watch uh, the news and you mm. see trends in some African countries, mm. does it break your heart? I don't want to specify okay. any country in this regard, but naturally, uh, we, we are still um, uh, beset as a continent with all the drawbacks you can think of, if it's uh, conflict, if it's disease, if it's un uh, poverty, unemployment, everything, drought, everything, uh, we see uh, it around us on our continent. And naturally, as an African, I feel heartbroken mm. any time I, I see. And unfortunately, the media uh, thrive on sensationalism. And so they want to show all these negatives. And any time you turn on telly and you see these things happening, Naturally, as an African, I get depressed. And how do you feel when people say that the AU has failed? AU hasn't failed. I don't agree with that. AU is a very young thing. And I've told you, Africa is huge. Mm -hmm. I think it's about the second or third biggest continent on the planet mm -hmm. of many countries of diverse backgrounds. This time around, not so much of liberation from colonialism and, say, apartheid and domination by other peoples, but uh, to share a vision of how we can develop economically and socially. And uh, it's just a bit over 10 years. And to expect that within the 10 years, there will be such dramatic changes, uh, it's a bit too idealistic. And I, I, I'm a pragmatist, and I don't uh, agree that AU is failing. It's doing well. Uh, in fact, it's prescribing that uh, African nations should give themselves leaderships that the people have chosen constitutionally through the ballot box. Mm. To the extent that it even prescribes, uh, or proscribes, I should use the word, proscribes, coup making. Anybody who would assume power by force, like used to be just uh, two, three decades ago, that person should be uh, sort of banned from taking part in activities of the union. That's, I believe, a, quite a, dra a dramatic and almost revolutionary step for a continent to take. It, it also prescribes uh, um, partnerships because uh, Africa should not uh, pretend to be inventing its own wheel of development. So it prescribes partnerships both from within and outside Africa so we can leapfrog. We're coming by the technologies that we may not have, coming by capital uh, to, for investment. Uh, of course, always knowing how to negotiate with partners and also for us to set the framework that would attract the investments we need uh, to do the infrastructure, to create wealth, People talk of uh, reducing poverty. Mm -hmm. I do not subscribe to that. I would rather talk of creating the wealth because I don't believe you fight poverty with poverty. Mm -hmm. Rather, you need wealth to conquer poverty. And we've got all the natural resources. And I believe that even the human stock to generate the wealth for us to pull ourselves out of the many difficulties confronting us. And I believe that you are showing awareness of all these things and setting, helping set the framework and also uh, use the regional groupings we have, ECOWAS, SADEC, mm -hmm. and so forth and so on, to tackle the challenges. So AU, I believe, is all right. Okay. One of your many legacies, I mean, if anyone is to outline, mm -hmm. is when you decided to avail yourself first to the APRM. Mm -hmm. um, do you have uh, memories of it? Do you still remember that day? Uh, it's quite some time ago, <laughs> but uh, I was so confident mm -hmm. that... Uh, uh, our government was doing it right by the people of Ghana. And so I didn't think there was anything to hide. So when the African Union again 
devised the APRM, African Peer Review Mechanism, mm -hmm. as a way to measure uh, quality of governance uh, in our countries. And uh, some people suspected there could be uh, unforeseen uh, blocks in the path of any nation. Mm -hmm. I said, no, Ghana should take the step. And that's how we put Ghana forward, because we thought there should be transparency uh, in governance. And so this is, and I, I, I haven't regretted. After so many years, would you say that the APRM has been effective? Very little is actually here. Um, Ghana was first and uh, to have submitted itself. I believe second was, is it Rwanda and then Kenya? I think it, it was getting to the turn of Kenya to be peer reviewed when the troubles broke out, mm -hmm. I think 2007, 2008, and that uh, stalled the process. But uh, I hope the countries have come back together. And as of now, I believe there are as many as 30 countries on the continent uh, which voluntarily submit for the peer review mechanism. I, that, that's some way. Uh, it might take some time for us to get anywhere near perfection, but I believe we are in the right direction. Okay. I want to go through some of your achievements while okay. in office. Okay. Uh, the first will be the introduction and successful implementation of some social intervention programs that the country continues to uh, enjoy uh, when you were in mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that these programs are being executed the way you wanted to see it after uh, a number of years. For instance, the school feeding program, the capitation grants, the NHIS. Are you happy, impressed with the way it's being run? Let me be fair from scratch. Okay. If you are asking me to mark myself. <laughs> I'm not asking you to. Uh, that's what you are doing. <laughs> then naturally I would say I'm tops. <laughs> but that might not be fair. Uh, but uh, listening around, it looks like there's still a lot of room for improvement and uh, things haven't continued the way we envisioned they would continue in the implementation of these programs. Uh, if you'd remember before uh, 2001, the policy in the country with regards to healthcare was called cash and carry. Uh, it's really portrayed the, um, the very smart mentality. The Ghanaians have got a sense of sometimes wicked uh, sense of humor, uh, cash and carry for healthcare, meaning if you do not have money, you die. That's what it was. And uh, so we introduced the uh, National Health Insurance Scheme. I know there's a lot of debate, people wanting to deny us the credit, the government I let credit for doing it. Before we launched it, I believe it was the Catholic Church that had done something in in Kranza, and I believe somewhere around Damongo, which was uh, just a community service. But they were doing it successfully. So our government got inspired by that. And then we sent out um, uh, some uh, experts to other countries that seemed to be doing it in East Africa. And I think then there was a measure of it in uh, Zimbabwe also, we sent people out to study and then to come and advise. And it was from that we formulated the policy and launched it. But even as we speak, there are still people in Ghana who would say, for, for, for political reasons, say, no, no, it wasn't done by NPP. It was done by NPP, I can assure you. And we really moved the country out of the cash and carry thing. Uh, on a, a, an affordable premium, uh, you'd remember... <laughs> It was uh, the 2008 uh, a party suggested they would pay just one premium for life. How would you run an insurance policy on just a premium? The one-time premium. Uh, one-time premium. <laughs> it means they didn't share in the vision, nor would they even understand the uh, mechanics of launching or working the program. So naturally, there's been a, a stalling and near slump in the implementation of uh, the health insurance scheme. But it's still, at least, uh, if you like, tottering along. Mm. Uh, we hope it will regather steam under right leadership. 
uh, because it must come to stay. And uh, hopefully, Ghanaians will see the difference in the near future. Uh, the capitation uh, grants mm -hmm. was, uh, yes, uh, prescribed by constitution, but at least it took our government to launch it. Perhaps other governments wouldn't have been able to do it, but we did it. And that too has come to stay. Uh, the other thing is uh, the school feeding. That was not prescribed by constitution. I, again, uh, it became a thing of the times. We saw that school enrollment uh, in the poorer parts of the country was low. And uh, we wanted, especially the girl child, to be retained in school, to be kept in school till maturity for a girl uh, with, from our culture and backgrounds. Uh, age 14, 15 would be the age uh, of puberty and a, a bit of rights. And so we said we should keep all our girls as far as possible. So we, in addition to capitation grant, we introduced the school feeding to hold the children generally, but more so the girl child, in schools. So parents wouldn't have the excuse of, say, taking them out uh, to go and uh, either do kaya year or petty trading to uh, supplement incomes. And truly, when we introduced that, enrollment jumped within the first year or so mm -hmm. by a huge percentage. And it's necessary that uh, this policy is really maintained and even improved upon by successive regimes in the country. Uh, further, since we were been introducing the school feeding program, we were thinking of nutrition and also uh, uh, economy, economics, well, because the, the, uh, the people who were preparing the meals for children were supposed to be the mothers who otherwise might not have yeah. much to do. And they would be paid for the services, and they would use foodstuffs, local foodstuffs, not imported food. So uh, there was a cyclical uh, impact, economic impact, to, to move uh, the economy, especially in the rural parts of the country. So all these things we introduced, very, not for petty politics, not for short-term gain. Mm -hmm. We were taking long-term view of things. And uh, we hope successive regimes would uh, sustain these policies for the good of Ghana mm -hmm. as a whole. Another thing was the repeal of the criminal libel law. Yes. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'm not too sure that you're a radio buff. You listen to radio and watch television a lot. Uh, but there are some who think that uh, the freedom of speech, that the media has been blessed with, it's been abused these days. There's a general lack of irresponsibility on our airwaves. You know, the media is allowing just about anybody to sit in front of cameras and in front of microphones and they spew all sorts of things. Uh, recently, uh, I don't know if you've been following the news, some panelists who uh, uh, went into a diet trap, threatened judges. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the media landscape? As much as I would condemn anybody committing excesses and abusing rights, I would be the last person to say because of that, uh, this law should be reinstated. No. The motto of our nation, Ghana's national motto, is freedom and justice. And you, you can't say people are free when they are in a way denied freedom of thought and of expression. And how do you express yourself? Yes, you may use uh, perhaps dance forms, and, but centrally, you would have to speak. So let the people speak. Only let them be responsible. Let them have a sense of responsibility. And uh, this is where the justice bit comes in. If you exceed your freedom of expression, there should be the law to deal with you. You talk of the laws of libel and so forth and so on. Let those things work. Uh, the solution to the excesses is, does not lie in uh, zipping uh, the expressiveness of uh, the media. You are media people. 
uh, I'm not a, a buff in the sense of being a media person, <laughs> but I believe I know the uses of uh, the work of the media. And uh, I, I, again, I don't regret, even though uh, we've been at the uh, butt of some <laughs> of the yeah. uh, abuses and falsehoods and so forth and so on. Uh, you see, when you've caged any uh, being, I was going to say any animal, <laughs> but when you descend even to the lower animals, you cage any animal, like say a goat for some time, and then free it, and you see the reaction. Mm -hmm. They immediately, they will jump out of the cage, run by helter-skelter till they find their balance and then they slow down and behave normally. If the lesser beings would do that, what do you expect of humans? So when the country had suffered the zip of the mouth for so long, the colonial authorities introduced that law to zip the media. And then successive regimes after independence continued with that. So there wasn't criticism. Everybody lived in fear of authority. And fortunately, we had suffered opposition. When I say we, I'm talking of my side of the yeah. political divide. We suffered opposition for so long it's, uh, with uh, harsh consequences for some, some even losing their lives in detention without trial. For not uh, even abusing, being abusive to people in authority, but just expressing differences of opinion. We got chance, we said no. Get that law of the statute books. And it was the first law we repealed. Mm -hmm. And naturally, when we repealed it first, within a short space of time, we saw a mushrooming of FM stations, <laughs> newspapers, yeah. and unfortunately for us, most of them turned their guns on us. <laughs> so some people even came to say, ah, you see what you've done, the consequences? See how these people are abusing freedom of speech? And say, let's take it easy. See, when we've been caged for so long and we are freed, what do you expect? The yeah. first reaction would be for us to go like crazy. But in due course, we find stability. But the stability would come with the application of the laws, the laws that would, again, and still responsibly, a sense of responsibility across the board for all of us. If you go shoot your mouth where you shouldn't shoot and say you are summoned uh, before uh, the Supreme Court or some high court or other for discipline, the rest of us, we learn that uh, perhaps there should be limits yeah. to expression. Or if you go and uh, slander or libel or defame another person, and they take you to court, and then uh, the court imposes a damage that would break uh, you economically, the rest of us would learn. A time would come when uh, we live and allow others to live in decency and in normalcy. Okay. So this is the way for us to learn. Okay. Now my last batch of questions will focus on the elections. In a busy okay. election year like this, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've, you do remember uh, mm -hmm. what you were doing in 2000 and in 2008 and how you had to crisscross uh, the country. In a busy election year like this one, what kind of message would you give to political communicators as they try to win votes? Well, elections, if they are genuine, are competitive. And in any race, uh, there's rivalry, and so necessarily there's tension. Uh, when tension brews, uh, it's not everybody that can take mm -hmm. tension in their stride easily. So some lose balance and they begin to talk out of turn. And, uh, uh, but the whole idea of uh, constitutional uh, democracy is that uh, society uh, would use its power. Now, let me say it here now, that I believe in the sovereignty of the individual. And that's what I believe the Ghana Constitution also means. 
we all as individuals, um, since we are committed to democracy as our constitution prescribes, constitution that we promulgated, mm -hmm. it wasn't imposed by anybody. We uh, went into referendum to promulgate it. The sovereignty is with the individual. But then uh, for governance, we are a very populous nation. It's not all of us that can go into, say, Jubilee House that is now called Flagstaff House to serve as president. Uh, not all of us can go into Parliament House to sit. So we use the representative mechanism. Um, and thankfully, uh, our vote is supposed to be secret. How I would vote is a matter that only my conscience and that of my God, honoring God, that would know. It's not anybody's business. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case and we all subscribe to this, uh, and I want your vote because I want to represent you, I need to convince you that when you give me that power of yours, that's your vote, I'll go and work to better your lot. I shouldn't come with uh, either sharp teeth, as uh, <laughs> we heard some time ago, or a cudgel to knock you on the head or to threaten or to abuse a judiciary. No, that's not how to do it. Just to extract the vote from you. We should be show orderliness. We should show that uh, we are enlightened as a society and that the whole thing is about convincing ourselves to use our votes with wisdom and with purpose, a sense of purpose, so as to put in place a government that would come to, to serve. We want servant leaders to come and serve us so uh, collectively we get the sort of society in which all of us can live uh, truly to fulfill the motto of the nation again, freedom and justice. Uh, but the way we carry on just in face of elections because we are competing, uh, a lot of times uh, leave so much to be desired. It would seem as if we do not understand the uses of an election. The whole idea is to, for us to queue in an orderly way to cast a vote on an individual basis and then at the end of the day count should show uh, who uh, should become our president or who should become our uh, member of parliament or even when we go lower down uh, assemblyman yeah. or, or whatever. Uh, of course uh, since we are a human society uh, the human factor tends to be unpredictable many a time. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the arbiter overseeing uh, the orderliness and fairness of the process, which is the Electoral Commission, should be uh, truly committed uh, to the people you know, uh, to serve uh, its role uh, in such a way across the board we all feel that uh, it's been free, truly impartial a transparent. Uh, Are you seeing uh, that so far from the EC? Well, there's a lot of uh, argument going on now, and uh, it's not uh, something that has come instantaneously. Uh, it's, there's history to it. Uh, in the past, things haven't been too uh, equal to expectation. And because of that, a lot of suspicion has been uh, left in the system. And uh, so everything should be done by the current Electoral Commission to eradicate the suspicions uh, in a, a fair way, in an enlightened way, in the people, so the people would uh, support it in this onerous responsibility of ensuring the country is well served. Okay. Mm. I'm not sure if you've been monitoring the president's accounting to the people at all, but mm. the NDC seem to think that they've invested massively in infrastructure and the NPP has no message at all as we go into this election. This is why uh, sometimes people say politics is a game. Mm. Uh, politics is far from game. It's a serious matter. Uh, but uh, into political electioneering, uh, there's what's called campaigning. And you go around in many places, even in the so-called developed parts of the world, you, there's a lot of fanfare to it. Mm -hmm. Some would go with brass bands and a lot of uh, 
drinking and eating and fashion and so forth and so on. Uh, and in the period, except when people are committing excesses uh, in traducing and portraying uh, falsehoods about others, except those times, you allow a, a sort of some room to the politician to uh, talk uh, about this is policy. If it's policy, let the people see it, and eventually the people will decide. NPP would also go and also say there has been a failure of policy. It's not just the past eight years. Before NPP came into office, it was NDC in office. Let us even begin from 92 when we started with the fourth Republican constitution. NPP, NDC had the first eight years virtually unchallenged. What did we see? How did the NPP, or why did the people give power to NPP? It was failure of policy, totally. NPP came in eight years. Well, uh, the f next eight years has been given to NDC. So it seems Ghana is uh, maturing in the way it picks. NDC is in its eighth year uh, since 2009. So if they've, they've achieved so much, the people will show. If they've not measured up to the expectation of the people, again, come, is it uh, 7th November, I believe the Ghanaians will show. Main thing is for us, all of us, to have a sense of limits so we do not overshoot our mouths. We do not uh, make it seem like we've created heaven on earth because it hasn't happened. We are still in Dumsa, for instance. They talk of roads. I believe the Ministry of Roads shows that uh, NPP in this time, within a space of eight years, did more roads than has been done ever. People say no. But I'm telling you, from Nkrumah Circle all the way to Kumasi, through Kumasi, uh, all the way, if you know Kumasi Magazine, all the way to Techimai, about 75 miles from Kumasi, all the way through Wenchi, uh, through Bamboy, to Bali, the hometown of the president himself. All that road was done within that short space of time, and people was in power. And that wasn't the only road. This is the longest stretch of road in Ghana. Within that is we did, and that was top quality. Look at uh, the George Bush Highway. NDC, I see, wants to share <laughs> in the credits of doing that. When NDC didn't contribute anything to that road, but it was done by an, an MPP. Look at from Malam Junction all the way to Yamaransa. Look at from uh, the circle in Tema all the way to Sagakope and Akachi. Uh, so what are people talking about? And in all the ten regions and so, but that's politics. So the NDC can go around and say NPP didn't do anything and it's eight years. But the other thing that people overlook, again, you are drawing me to do a bit of, uh, I didn't want to sound like comparing, but I tell you, if you do not have um, a solid, stable macro economy, that's policy frameworks, the public sector frameworks, you cannot have any economic development. And NPP government took the HIPIC initiative because 2001, Ghana's economy was down and out. We were insolvent. No country would give Ghana any credit. So what did we do? We saw that unless we told the truth about the state of the economy to the international community, no uh, donor community or credit, creditor institution like the multilaterals would treat with Ghana. So we took the hip pick initiative and then agreed that we would restore the macroeconomic sanity of our country. Because it's on that basis, uh, the outside partners are assured that when they extended credit to us, uh, they could hope to regain the outlays they made with us. So we did it, and we came out of that initiative in record time. You go to IMF, they will tell you, because of the disciplines. Government 
cutting back on excessive borrowing, both from within and from outside, living within the budget that itself had done for the country in those times. And then helping, um, creating an enabling atmosphere, not overtaxing people. So investors started looking into Ghana. That's how well, they, 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 many banks came into Ghana. But that time, 2000, the banks in Ghana didn't count to even about 10 or so. Time 2000, when Ghana had about 25 banks, and they had started competing among themselves, chasing market women and business people to come and take credit. Mm -hmm. Can you go around now, we've been to borrow, at what interest rates? So, and then the inflation, which was over 40%. Time we were, 2008 we were living, inflation had come to 18%. Tough, but we did it. So we, nobody, they don't want to give us credits, like with, with the oil find. They, oh, they didn't do it. Kofor didn't put oil in. The, who put oil in, on, in, in the ground? Yes, creator. But then it takes policy. It takes uh, making the economy attractive for people to come and look for the oil for them to be convinced that when they invested to bring up the oil, they wouldn't be cheated out or booted out. This is how they came, and this is how Ghana found oil and gas in commercial quantity for the first time. Uh, so we, we uh, let N NDC talk. NPP, I believe, will also talk. And then the people will decide. As I said, the people are sovereign. Mm -hmm. It's not the government. Government is sovereign only because it is representing the people. And the people will exercise sovereignty, I believe, come November. Thank you very much, President Kofu, for talking to us. Thank you.